The waters that bathe the south of Australia are a link preserved from a former union. Fifty million years ago, this island continent broke away from the Antarctic, abandoning it to the cold currents which froze it. Now, strong winds, called the Roaring Forties, crash against this rugged coast, carrying with them life from the ice in the form of rich nutrients transported by the currents from the South Pole. Deep down beneath the ice of the Antarctic, 2,000 kilometers from here, the cold waters collect minerals, oxygen, and carbon dioxide. Here on the southern Australian coast, these waters come to the surface, giving to rise a veritable explosion of life, an incredible proliferation of species from plankton eaters to specialist predators. For the sharks, this is a region of plenty. The basic design of their bodies is 300 million years old and is literally perfect. But only one of them is called death. Beyond the reef lies the kingdom of the great killer. The vast blue, the cold waters which are tinged with red when hunger demands. The great white shark, 2,000 kilos of savage strength at the service of a mouth. A prodigious animal which after hundreds of years of blind terror, we are now learning to admire. We are going to visit his domains. The southern coast of Australia was once joined to the Antarctic, forming part of the supercontinent Gondwana. Since then, many things have changed in the wildlife of this island continent. As it drifted north, the Australian plate crashed into Asia, bathing part of its coasts in tropical and subtropical currents. In this way, on the Australian continental platform, the cold, nutrient-rich waters of the South Pole met warmer ones coming down from the Indian Ocean. When Australia moved north and the Antarctic south, the system of ocean currents was changed. The Antarctic froze over and the top of Australia came into contact with the tropical currents. Today, both influences remain, creating the two types of water we are going to explore. People often think that the sea is full of life, that everywhere creatures of one size or another swim. However, that is not true. In fact, the open ocean is almost a desert with nothing to eat and no one to eat it. This is not the case of this coast. When the cold waters reach here and rise to the surface, they come into contact with the sunlight and warm up. And it is precisely the presence of light that works the miracle and causes life to flourish along these beaches.
The seabirds catch small fish and crustaceans, which in turn owe their abundance to the plankton and microscopic algae that thrive close to the coast. These seabirds form colonies of thousands of individuals and contribute to fertilizing the water with their excrement rich in nitrogen. It has been scientifically demonstrated in other areas of the world where conditions are similar that when these bird colonies disappear, it is not long before the nearby waters lose a large part of their population of small fish. This has not happened in southern Australia. Here, the chain of hunters and hunted is maintained intact and ready to take maximum advantage of the gifts sent from the Antarctic in the form of dissolved nutrients. The transparent, rough waters allow the sun to penetrate sufficiently to work the miracle on which life is based, photosynthesis. The brown seaweed form veritable forests stretching up from the bottom in search of the light at the surface. Up there, the seals and sea lions feel so safe from the sharks that they're about to establish their breeding colonies. All this life is a result of a long journey made by the melted waters from the Antarctic to Australia, a journey across the ocean floor which can take millions of years. The process begins at the end of the Antarctic winter. The hours of sunlight become longer and longer until there are 24 hours of sunlight a day. And in the warmth, the gigantic solid blocks of ice slowly melt. Then the surface of the water warms up, generating the movement of currents which stir up the cold water below, bringing it and its minerals to the surface. This cold current, rich in nutrients, flows to the coast of Australia, a gift from the South Pole. This regenerating force has an immediate effect, which can be seen with the naked eye. There are vast stretches of brown seaweed running hundreds of miles along the coast. Here, animal and vegetable life flourishes, first in the form of microscopic algae, and later the zooplankton that feed on them. Like veritable jungles, the seaweed provides shelter to millions of creatures hoping to remain unnoticed among the dense vegetation. Kelp forests like this one contain so many different species that their variety of wildlife can be up to 20 times greater than in the warm waters of tropical seas. This crab has cultivated its own garden above its head in order to remain unnoticed, but the effect is very different when it is time to move house.
The brown seaweed is fixed onto the substratum by means of a strong claw-like grip, the only function of which is to serve as an anchor against the strength of the storms and currents. They do not absorb anything, nor are they in any other way similar to the roots of more developed plants. These provide an incredibly strong hold, a firm base for the rest of the plant whose biological obligation is to float and reach up to the light at the surface. The invertebrates that share the rocks with them also know that here you have to cling on hard if you don't want to be swept off. This is a world of washed out colors and soft forms. The cloudy water and the strong undertow mean the polyps here do not develop the hard forms nor the brightly colored designs of tropical coral reefs. They try to catch their quota of plankton here where food passes in front of everyone, and all you have to do is take it. The herbivore fish like these graze as if on a meadow by a forest. They form the next layer up in the food pyramid, turning the seaweed into meat. Their chromatic pattern is the same as that of zebras, the most distinctive thing in this ecosystem of discrete beings, the browns, the ochres, and the cloudy waters. The masters of mimetism are without a doubt the cuttlefish who can control their pigment cells at will depending on the situation and their mood. A very useful skill when the predators are out on patrol, ready to pounce at any opportunity. This is a heterodontiform shark, specialized in detecting invertebrates hiding in the sand. This ray is also a threat for anything that will fit in its mouth and uses its sensors to search for food on the seabed. Dense waters, thick with biomass, full of mouths that eat everything. The warm water southern seas always hold surprises, especially the experts in camouflage. It is precisely here that we will find two of the most incredible disguises in the animal kingdom. The sea dragons live in no other place in the world. This one is a weedy sea dragon looking for prey among the fronds. But the apotheosis of this style is the other species that lives in these waters, the leafy sea dragon, a baroque fish related to the seahorses. Like a madman's dream, it proudly glides in its vertical world. By suction, it traps fish larvae and crustaceans, which die without ever knowing what it was that ate them. They're very sensitive animals, light, Pressure or stress affect them enormously. Nothing in its life which lasts for around seven years is ordinary. Its biology is an enigma, and perhaps it is best it should remain that way. The abundance of fish around the forests of kelp and seagrass also attract the sea lions who soon will establish their breeding colonies in the rockiest areas. 
But they must never forget that this coast is dangerous. When they dive into the water in search of their usual prey, they never go further out than strictly necessary and always looking down in the azure depth where the great killer lurks. The sea lions are strong animals and excellent divers, but they try to make sure they never swim alone. Almost all the fish that live in open waters swim in groups. Without the protection of the seabed or the seaweed, the best tactic is to hide behind others, hoping that if an attack comes, you will not be the unlucky one. Synchronizing their movements thanks to the nerves running along their sides, banks of fish like these barracudas are both predators and potential prey. But the open waters are not an easy place in which to live. Only those fortunate enough to be sufficiently large to be respected can wander alone, like shadows, filtering the only abundant food source, the tiny plankton which this devilfish devours by the kilo. The others, small and vulnerable, mass together, trying to form larger beings in the hope of dissuading hunters. If they are attacked, the confusion is such that it is very probable that none will be caught. Everyone is both hunter and hunted, sea creatures of different sizes in search of food, and always an enemy somewhere close by. These species that swim with no contact with the seabed are called pelagic and know how to make the most of the gift from the Antarctic. However, these waters are not equally welcoming to all. Here, where the confluence of two very different marine currents created a paradise for animals, is hell for the intruders at the surface, where the roaring forties make this one of the most dangerous places in the world in which to travel by boat. In the Middle Ages, European logic and mythology already conjectured the existence of a great land of the south, or Terra Australis, to balance the weight of the land masses of Europe and Asia in the northern half of the planet. In the 15th century, the Spanish trying to find this place. In 1567, Alvaro de Mendaña discovered the Solomon Islands to the northeast of Australia, and this encouraged Spain to send more expeditions in search of the lost continent. The Spanish explorer, Luis Valles Torres, navigated between Australia and New Guinea, giving his name to the Torres Straits. But the Dutchman Dirk Hartog was the first European to land on Australian soil 72 years before the English pirate Dampier convinced the crown of his country that this land was worth the trouble. And history would determine it would come under British rule. All this history and much more is written in the remains scattered offshore and which now provide a home for some of the underwater life of the cold coasts of southern Australia. But if we travel north along the west coast, we come to a very different type of ocean floor. 
Following the underwater tracks of the manta rays and sea eagles, we enter the warm tropical waters which everyone thinks of as rich in life forms, but which in reality hide great surprises which we are going to discover. The deep blue little by little turns to turquoise. We are in a transition zone between the two types of water. The strength of the waves is broken by the first corals that protect warmer, calmer waters. The bacteria that break down the organic material rapidly reproduce in these waters which are warm but still receive the gift from the Antarctic. Matter is deposited while the energy of the sun gives rise to an atmosphere very similar to that which existed at the time when life on Earth was just beginning. Here in Shark Bay, these strange forms bear the mark of a decisive moment in the history of our planet. They are called stromatolites and their structure is the result of enormous groups of cyanobacteria, greenish-blue bacteria which, if there is plenty of sunlight, produce oxygen from the water. This may seem like just one more natural process, but if we consider they have been doing this for 3,500 million years, we will realize that they represent the origin of the evolution of all existing animals. From just water and light, they filled the atmosphere with breathable oxygen. Without them, we would not be here. In this area, the cyanobacteria produce a sticky mucus which traps the particles of sand. This structure is then strengthened by calcium carbonate carried in the seawater. But these traumatolites are not the only phenomenon exclusive to Shark Bay. On the beaches of Monkey Mia, there are frequent meetings between two of the most intelligent mammals in the world. Here, the wild bottlenose dolphins are used to contact with humans and swim close by them. Such is the attraction that guards are necessary to ensure that people do not frighten the marine visitors. <coughs> but this relationship is more than a mere curiosity. The Australian Aborigines have traditionally spoken of dolphin energy. According to them, they achieve spiritual enlightenment through telepathic mind-to-mind -mind communication with the cetacean. They call it the dream of the dolphin. According to this ancient legend, human beings are descended from dolphins which never forget they are related to man. What's certain is that the dolphins come of their own free will and seem to prefer the company of children to that of adults. People that come to see them say they feel something special, a sense of peace, a strange happiness they can't explain. The dolphins even bring their young here, who thus learn to trust humans. But why do they do it? From a strictly biological point of view, it makes no sense unless we introduce such unscientific terms as affinity or interspecies friendship. 
All the experiments carried out have demonstrated the evident improvement of people with problems in relating to their surroundings when they are given therapy sessions with dolphins. It has been scientifically proven that dolphins have saved the victims of shipwrecks by carrying them or leading them to the beach, that they use complex language and are able to establish close relations with humans. Perhaps the dream of the dolphin is much more than a myth. Perhaps once again the Australian Aborigines long ago realized a zoological truth which has not yet been discovered. Very close to Shark Bay in this region where the Antarctic plankton meet the tropical warmth lives another incredible animal. It is not related to the seals or the whales. It has its own style and is called the dugong. The dugongs belong to the family of Sirenians or sea cows and are the only entirely vegetarian marine mammals. To maintain their 300 kilos in weight, they need to feed constantly on the underwater pastures and it is a complete mystery how they manage to live on a diet with such a high salt content. Their upper lip directs the seaweed into their mouths. Their skeleton is heavy and dense to prevent them from floating too much. They live a calm life of around 70 years in these mixed waters. As we move further up the west coast to Australia and approach the Tropic of Capricorn, corals are more in evidence and start to form reefs. The coral reef is a very different ecosystem from that of the cold waters of the south. The water is filled with light and color. The intense activity we can see is not the result of a marine current carrying nutrients. The coral reef is like a gigantic self-contained organism in which energy passes from one layer to the next with just two essential ingredients, the sun and the sea. The corals are specialists in poor waters like these, provided they are clear. If we dive down just a few meters to where there is less sunlight, we can see that the variety of species quickly diminishes. Nearer the surface, the coral world flourishes in all its splendor. Over 2,000 types of animals live here with strange relationships among the different species, all of them adaptations to ensure survival in such a competitive society. This is a pair of clownfish who choose to live where others die. They confidently swim between the stinging tentacles of this anemone, knowing no harm will come to them. The tentacles are armed with poisonous cells, which would mean certain death for any other fish. The clownfish are immune because the anemone does not recognize them as foreign bodies. They are like part of the family. The entire reef is full of specialists ready to eat anything edible. The trigger fish like this one can, with their tough mouths, attack any reinforced structure no matter how strong it is, and the parrotfish can even crush the corals. If you're among polyps, the best thing is to look like them, and we already have met the master of imitation. The cuttlefish also lives here just one more piece in the intricate puzzle of the reef. And, as always, they have to hide from the local marauding hungry mouths, in this case the grouper. They are members of the serenid family in virtually all the waters of the world. Their rear fins are a sure sign they can accelerate very rapidly if necessary.
One of the most dangerous killers is not, however, particularly large. Nor does it hide because it wants everyone to know who he is, so they'll leave him in peace. It is a sea snake of the Laticauda genus, a reptile which evolution has returned to the sea, adapting its anatomy to the new medium. One and a half meters in length, it hunts fish by surprising them in their lairs and injecting its deadly venom into them. Its flattened tail serves as a fin, making it easier to move around this strange, unpredictable landscape full of holes and cavities. Though it lives in the water, this species must periodically return to land to mate and lay its eggs. Like all snakes, it is dependent on the temperature of the environment it lives in, and so can only survive in warm waters like these. The Laticauda knows that all the creatures of the reef live very close to or hidden inside the structures that form this bizarre environment. In their constant wanderings around the coral reef, it is common for two of these snakes to meet. When that happens, it is important their natural aggression should be inhibited until they recognize each other, and so they embrace and remain still until they have made sure. Once they have checked each other out, they separate and each one goes on his way. But the corals are animals and would not be able to take advantage of the energy from the sun were it not for the fact that inside them live tiny algae called zoosantile. These produce oxygen and carbon and generate the limestone that forms the hard skeleton of the corals. The more sunlight, the more they grow. Oblivious to life of the coral reef, the largest fish in the world returns south in search of the plankton it feeds on. It is the whale shark, a colossus 80 meters in length, peaceful, inoffensive, and curious. It slowly swims around the sea with its mouth open, filtering tiny crustaceans and fish. Its life is a mystery. In fact, it was only discovered by science relatively recently. With him, we are returning to the cold waters where we began our story. From July to the middle of October, the waters of the west of Australia are also visited by the humpback whales, a type of whale 30 tons in weight, which reproduce in the north, then swim south to feed near the Antarctic. On these seasonal migrations, the humpbacked whales swim close to the shore and are easily recognizable from their enormous pectoral fins up to five meters long. These are the longest limbs of any living animal.
They are mammals up to 18 meters long, and this journey will take them 7,000 miles during which they do not eat. No one knows the reason for this strange behavior. With them we arrive in the dominions of the great white shark, the dark blue waters. And here a tragedy repeated every year is about to occur. The sea lions sense that the breeding season is approaching. Along the coast of southern Australia and Tasmania, they begin to gather near suitable places, playing and swimming with a characteristic skill. The mature males remain aroused for days, rounding up their harems, fiercely defending them from rivals. But in the water, getting overexcited can have fatal consequences. For underwater, they are not alone. The great white sharks like nothing better than a fresh fur seal, warm red meat covered in delicious fat, clean and easy to digest. Despite the name, the fur seals are not seals at all. They belong to a different family, that of the sea lions. One difference is that they have ears, and another, equally obvious one, is that the sea lions use their rear flippers to walk on land like any other mammal. The males are in search of a suitably receptive female, but the colony also contains many females impregnated the previous season and which have just given birth. Alongside the adults, we can see the nurseries of the newborn cubs with their dark fur waiting for their mothers to return with food. Among the rocks, they become curious about this newly discovered world, the vast blue horizon that stretches before them. For now, they are only allowed to splash around in the pools left by the retreating tide, but the sea is calling them, and the worst enemy knows it. The diving skills of the adult fur seals in their social nature means that they are difficult to catch by surprise when they are near the coast. But the great white shark comes to its annual rendezvous with the seal cubs. All it needs to do is approach the colony and wait for its chance. This individual is eight meters of sheer fury and almost 2,000 kilos of expert hunter. Though it is a fish, its blood is 10 degrees centigrade warmer than the surrounding water, so its muscles perform better in attack. It detects the electrical fields generated by its victims and is equipped with a system of navigation based on the Earth's magnetic field. Its sense of smell is infallible and the muscles around its eyes are warmer than the others to give it optimum sight. He's here, and almost everyone flees.
Once more, the white death has claimed a victim, staining red the blue shroud of the baby sea lion. The sideways movements of the head help the serrated teeth to cut through the young flesh like butter. The black legend of the white shark has been forged on the basis of exaggerations. Its fame as a monstrous devourer of men is far in excess of the reality, but for decades it has served as an excuse for uncontrolled fishing. Their impressive appearance made them the most sought after of all fishermen's trophies. In reality, attacks on humans are rare and strangely many of the victims survive. Like these three mutilated men who now spend their lives killing the white sharks that attack them. Why has such an efficient predator left so many men alive? The myth of the man-eater which began with the reconstruction of the enormous jaw of a now extinct relative of the great white is slowly being replaced by fascination for such a unique animal. In the past, the boat set out with the intention of killing one, but now what they want to do is photograph and film them because the scientific community has raised the alarm. This is a vulnerable animal that could disappear if overfishing is allowed to continue. Proof of how mercilessly the great white has been hunted down is the fact that they are now increasingly difficult to find. They are most common in South Africa and here in Australia, coinciding precisely with the largest colonies of seals and sea lions. There he is. The white shark possesses the curiosity of all prowlers, and so it will almost certainly be attracted by the series of stimuli that have been prepared for it. The cages guarantee the safety of the camera operators, who with their flippers and neoprene diving suits look dangerously like the sea lions the whites usually eat. When it bites in order to test, the shark gets trapped and reacts violently. It becomes nervous and pulls at the cage, shaking it in its contents. A violent encounter provoked on purpose, but almost the only way to establish any kind of contact with this mystery of the oceans. It is looking at us with its black eyes, seemingly cold and calculating, the last thing its prey ever sees. It makes the so-called round of fear a typical maneuver we saw in the killing of the poor fur seal cub, but this time it detects strange elements in its surroundings. When images like this have been misinterpreted, they have given a false idea of this animal. For it, this is a very strange situation, not without its normal parameters, but it does allow us to admire the most feared predator on the planet. They are difficult to observe, they have to be lured with bait, it is virtually the only way to see them. But when the great white comes to these encounters, its nervous behavior is as a result of the smell of blood and the stress caused by the boat in the metal cages. It bites because a situation like this insults its finely tuned senses, but attracts the curiosity of the hunter. We now know that the white shark only attacks men by mistake or in self-defense, when in these cloudy waters it mistakes them for its normal prey, the sea lions. Now we understand why in these cases it bites once, then lets go, when it recognizes the texture and taste of humans, which it doesn't like. Now we know that every year many more people die as a result of lightning strikes or bees than from shark attacks. Thank you. 
It is so elusive that in seas where there are now hardly any seals and the white sharks eat any other prey that don't resemble man, not only are there no attacks, but people don't even suspect they exist. This is the case, for example, on the Mediterranean coasts of Spain, where the millions of tourists on the beaches are entirely unaware they share the water with this animal. The great white, which can live for around 40 years, does not reach sexual maturity until it is 10 years old. This and the low birth rate could mean its populations are seriously threatened. This fantastic animal is a symbol of the sea in which it lives, a sea which we are threatening, a much more deadly threat than the great white. Seen from the coast, the sea appears invincible makes us feel small, not realizing our own capacity for destruction. But down below, daily life is very hard for everyone. Both for the fish living in contact with the seabed and those whose lives are spent between two waters, finding food in the ocean is never easy. The seas of the world are interrelated systems. There is, in truth, only one sea, though we give it different names. Within this complex world, where all beings are important, the sharks occupy a very special place. It is relatively easy to defend the great white, but there are 350 other species of shark increasingly threatened by overfishing, with virtually no one paying any attention to their plight. Recent biological research into the shark's incredible metabolism may provide remedies for many human diseases, including cancer. The scientific community is increasingly looking to the sea as a source of new substances with which to work. They are perfect zoological machines that have barely changed since they were first created. Like all good designs, they have not been modified and continue to function. The two types of marine ecosystems around Australia, the one that depends on their nutrients from the Antarctic, cold and cloudy, and the one that feeds directly on the sun, light and warm, have revealed just a tiny part of their many secrets. No one knows how many answers lie in these waters, but one thing is certain, in the deep vast blue, in the salty abyss in which all these creatures live, only one is king. Car Caradon Carcarias, the White Death.